Hi, welcome to episode 108 of Fear of a Black Planet. I'm going to rant a little bit, as is customary, oh, about political correctness, but it's a specific thing <coughs> that I've figured out the, the trigger that winds me up about this. Because I was having a discussion with a friend and he was basically putting <clears throat> this idea that, you know, what's what's the problem with political correctness? It's uh, morality and basically, you know, I'm not going to apologise for defending political correctness because I think we should be decent to each other and we should be considerate to each other and you know 20 years ago it wasn't as easy for a gay man to be in politics or or on mainstream television or in public life as it is now um uh it's it's good to have children for instance not to be exposed to misogynistic jokes and understand that that's the norm and all these sorts of things and basically people who defend political correctness will tend to to fudge common decency and what is actually an ideological position, and my, and the point. So the 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 one of the things that well, there's two responses you usually get. You usually get this kind of shifty thing. Um. Usually, or you either get right outrage. How can you possibly be defending hate? That's you know, and it's angry, and it's accusative, and it's condemning. Which I've had, and it's not very nice, and. And actually, I would say that it's much more damaging and insulting and hateful than, than anything you could accuse someone of criticising political correctness of doing. But also, you, you, you will get this kind of shifty fudging or um, uh, a kind of uh, condescension, like you need a re-education in, in common decency. <clears throat> And the, the, the first one you can sort of deal with because you can just dismiss it is just, and, you know, that doesn't really bother me because it's so obvious. And the people who, well, it's usually the same people, but when that tactic is deployed, it doesn't, it isn't something so difficult to shake off. You just need a bit of a thick skin, which I don't, but you can move on from it is my point. Well, you can't really move on from the from the, the patronising, condescending, conceptual fudge that goes on in, in the defence of political correctness because the insinuation is that not only are you defending bad behaviour, nastiness, hate, but that you are in some way defending it for some surreptitious reason that there that there's some there's there's an insinuation about your motivations and uh, you either get a little sort of sideward glance or someone explicitly says you know why would you why would you have a problem with this but what it what the fudge what that fudge does is it denies and it's designed to i mean the, the at the risk of sounding condescending myself, I think it, it, to, to use the arguments to either make oneself a useful idiot or to be actually ideologically driven. And I tend to think that most people who use the fudge argument are just being useful idiots, not in, you know, we're all useful idiots for something. We're all useful idiots for consumerism. So I'm not saying I'm beyond, I'm not making some superior judgment there. Um, but to make that accusation you're basically what why you're being a useful idiot is because you're 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 deploying you're deploying uh an intellectual argument which takes off the table any form of challenge and i think this is the trigger for me is it, it, it's a, it's a subtle sleight of hand which people don't do consciously and I mean useful idiot not in a, like, I, I have to say I'm an idiot. I'm a useful idiot for a lot of things. Like, we, we all do it. It's, it's how ideas and ideology tend to work in public life, and we've all got to be conscious of it. So I'm not making a personal stab at anyone who, who does this. I'm just saying I fear that what one becomes is that. Because <clears throat> it is such a sleight of hand 
to take all questions off the table, to take all forms of dissent off the table, to take all forms of challenge off the table under the guise of that's just hate. There could be no other possible reason. You basically saying you don't believe in bad, good man. Now there is as a sort of flank of the right wing, not all right wing, not all conservatives. There is a flank of the right wing who enjoy just being assholes, and I get that. And they really relish it, and they really see any opportunity to criticise political correctness as another avenue in their own, you know. And there's some people who are useful idiots on that side. And one has to be conscious that one isn't being that. And I am. But <clears throat> to say that that's the only reason that you would criticise political correctness is really, really irritating. I mean, it's so irritating because it denies that there there is a danger. Now, we ha and by political correctness, I mean just this kind of... What I mean by it is a paranoid paternalism about what can be said and what cannot be said. That's how I define it. I don't define it as good manners. I don't define it as equality or egalitarianism. It is a paranoia about the damage one can do with words rather than a, a, a contemplative or reflective consciousness about the impact that what one says on other people can have. It's, it ends up being... And possibly this is where the, the distinction between you know, healthy liberal leftism and just maniacal uh, ideological screeching and shrill paternalism lies is this paranoia. If you are just saying, like there's an, there's an early Orwell essay that basically says, you know, there's certain words which are very common in the English language, especially in colonial contexts. And I think he uses the N word when it was at a time very uncommon in use. And he says, you know, it's probably better that we don't use those words, even if we, we don't mean it in a bad way, because the effect that it has culturally is insidious over time. Now, a lot of people will just claim that that's only what they're saying when they're being politically correct, but they're not. They're not. And that's the point. Because what Orwell is saying there, he's not saying there should be a law. He's not saying that uh, one should be paranoid about it or that one should edit oneself because you f you fear down the line that maybe this word means this. Or that in every context, that word is having a damaging effect. It's not a blanket universal ideological position, and that's the difference. And it's not paranoid, and that's the difference. Um. So the difference lies is when you start getting paranoid and you start wanting to make laws about it. That's where I get off, and that's what irritates me. And I get enraged. The rage kicks in for me when I, when someone's basically insinuating that there isn't a point here, that there isn't some <clears throat> ideological like uh, propaganda going on. And by propaganda, I mean that taking ordinary common decency and common sense and shoveling in through the back door an ideology on the back of that. I, I guess communism did that in the in the 30s and 40s in America, where, uh, and even in Britain, where because you, you, Tony Benn was a Christian socialist, uh, Woody Guthrie was a Christian socialist, and their sense of socialism was the they were they made an explicit connection between and it's very explicit in Woody Guthrie a connection between Christian sharing, Good Samaritan. Um, if you do it to the least of me, you do it unto me, kind of, you do it unto the least of one of us, you do it unto me, or whatever that quote is and whatever gospel is, I don't know. But the idea that we're all, um, a man's a man for all that, that kind of Burns thing, which I've talked about before. And Burns as well, I think his radicalism probably came from his Christianity. In fact, I'm almost certain about that because it is this idea that we're all intrinsically of value, and that's certainly where you get Martin Luther King that that Christian socialism. <clears throat> but that's by being Christian socialist, it was sort of in practice immune from the ideological. And and the, but the thing I fear is that a lot of um, very bad ideas, for instance, the defence of Stalin, was able to be maintained in leftist circles only because that ideas of compassion and uh, equality, egal the egalitarianism of communism had been linked to the egalitarianism of Christianity. In practice, they're very different things, but 
that um, piggybacking or Trojan horse tactic, the propaganda tactic, to me is the most insidious because you end up defending mass murderers like Stalin because you're defending Christianity. And so it's this, but the communists were very good at this. I mean, they explicitly went out of their way to spread their dogma on the back of good intentions and on the back of genuine, sincere, felt uh, desires to end racism and to make life better in the early 20th century. But the cost of it was ushering in this this equally insidious form of imperialism and totalitarianism. So being anti-colonialist just meant you were standing for yet another form of revol a revolutionary version of colonialism. And this is what I worry about with political correctness is that it's sort of related to what Jordan Peterson got in trouble for with the trans issue. It's not that he thinks it's good to be nasty to people who, who identify as trans. He's explicitly said that many times and he's and he has had sat down and had conversations with trans people and he has said many times that if he was asked in class to it, depending on the situation, if it felt if it felt like it was a sincere thing and this person was gonna you know, on a humane level, they, they would suffer by not being called by a certain pronoun or addressed with a certain pronoun, then he would do it. But if they, if he felt that it was um, a tactic in some ways, and, <clears throat> and, it, and, it, and it could be, and lots of people with mental health issues use that as a tactic, and I, you know, I've got mental health issues, so I know what I'm talking about here. Um, if, if it was an attempt to win power and manipulate out of defence, out of weakness, out of a sense of fear and paranoia, fine. But still, it's not worth a therapist. I think this is where he was coming from. It's not worth a therapist just saying, blanket, I'm going to do this every single time. Because I think actually it might be the least ther therapeutic thing to, to do to go along with a certain thing. And then again, it might be the best thing to do. So you have to make that call. And a, an individual therapist can't really be therapeutic if they don't have this is a good example of what i mean in the terms of existentialism about individuality and the intrinsic value of human agency and the the locus of uh compassion and goodness being in within the individual not in the collective is an example of that if you're a therapist making a blanket statement about what's politically correct is not going to help you in practice be a good therapist you might have to say something which yeah, if, un if it was taken out of context, it would sound awful. Like, say, so yeah, I'm not going to call you by your pronoun. I don't think that's what you need right now. But equally, the right-wingers might say, well, let's make a law. We're not going to ever do that. Fuck that. Ugh. You know, like, I'm not saying that either. It is, the, it is a situational thing. And I think that's, that, that's kind of... Um, but Jordan Pearson's broad criticism of this movement of identity politics and political correctness and all this sort of paranoia, paranoic paternalism is what I'm going to start calling it, uh, is that under the guise of compassion, under the under it, that, the tactic weakens your defences because you think, why would I be against being nice to people? But it offers a program of niceness which is very rigid, very paternalistic, and very ideological. What do I mean by ideological? I simply mean a kind of shoddy simplistic version of Marxist conflict theory, which is, you know, there's a there's an oppressor and there's oppressed. And then what people tend to know is and maybe what people are thinking right now is they listen, oh, so you don't think they're oppressors, you don't think they're oppressed. Yes, but it's it's not a simple thing. I don't think that every white man's an oppressor and every black man's a victim. I think that there are broad sweeping generalizations which allow oppressions on those terms. But that's a different, more nuanced version, and I think that the the, the it's non ideological because it, it is open to being to taking different contexts into consideration, and it, it's it's um, <clears throat> when you're ideological about that, the danger of ideology is it allows it allows other people to have done the thinking before you. So whenever you get into so if you so for instance you pass a a, a road accident and it's a black guy and a white guy and they're arguing. You already have a, a a version of facts according to that, right? And if we're going to start ha issuing justice on the basis of predetermined, very paternalistic, high-minded ideas, rather than looking at the situation and saying, where was the source of fault genuinely? Was it the white guy or the black guy? It doesn't really matter about it. We're looking for justice, not 
skin color. This is why it matters. It's not just and and, and all of what I'm saying. The most frustrating, rage filling thing about this is, is that everything I'm saying here is nuance. And my friend the other night was got it, and so it felt one of the reasons I'm talking about it is it felt finally someone understood that I'm coming at this from a liberal point of view. This is a liberal critique. This is not a desire to treat people like a cunt and just not care. This is coming from the fact that I really that, that actually. True equality is served by by having everyone treated according to the same way under the law. And people say, oh, well, actually, the, 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 the system doesn't treat everybody like that, blah, 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 blah. Well, actually, number one, there's not actually any evidence for that claim, that suddenly being white gets you more justice in the court of law than being black. There's no, there's no you could say a crime rates, blah, 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 but there's plenty of other mitigating factors and variables involved in, in these statistical analyses. And I'm not a statistician, but I know that enough that to just say, on based on numbers, there's more certain people of this kind of thing. I could turn around and say, "Well, that's like a that's like a um, uh, and a men's rights activist turning around and say, "Well, there's more there's more men in prison than there are women, so shut up, right?" So, <clears throat> but also, the, 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 not only is it not provable, it is in itself of an ideological position. It's ushering in on the basis of what it seems to be correct, what seems to be nice, what seems to be a kind of feel-good logic, ushering in quite an ideological position because then it's it's only one half step away from saying, well, the system's corrupt, let's rip it down. And I just don't buy that. I don't think the default system in a, in a liberal democracy is as bad as people say it is. It's not perfect. It, it, it's by definition not perfect. It's non-utopian. That's why it's not perfect. But the but the great advantage of liberal humanistic the liberal humanism that I'm advocating on this podcast and and in my art is that it's inbuilt for has an inbuilt form of self critique. That's kind of what I thought the counterculture was all about. It's what I thought hip hop was all about. It's what I thought protest music was all about. It wasn't the system's inherently corrupt. It's the white man. Let's rip it down. It, it's rather the only way to maintain the integrity of of what this system can truly be is to maintain a healthy form of critique and dissent and counterculture within the culture. That, as far as I understand it, was the Martin Luther King position and the Gandhi position and the Romantics position. They weren't rebelling. They weren't calling for a complete decimation of society and a rebuilding it from the ground up. They were offering a critique from within the culture a renewal, a constant renewal of the culture, so that always, always, always we are going back to first principles of what it means to be a human being. Always, always, always we are going back to first principles of what it means to be a citizen. That It's an artistic, creative, cultural process. It's not an ideological process. That's true dissent. Dissent which is ideological isn't actually dissent. It's just... Here's my theory. It's, here's my theory. It's better. Let let's remake society in in my image. It's Napoleonic or Stalinistic. It's um, and so I guess a good example of that would be that this is why the free speech thing becomes such a touchstone issue for me because it's truly, truly, truly about how do you evolve human societies, how do you get rid of nasty, hateful views, how do you combat propaganda, lies, vested interests, the suffocation of the individual, the, the, the enslavement of human agency for pure economic gain, how do you combat all that? You do not combat it by instituting a communist regime. You do not combat it by ripping the system down. Because it's not... Because the, I think the where the liberal humanism comes in, actually, I think is that any systematic alternative is by definition wrong because it's systematic. 
True dissent is not systematic, it's cultural, it's artistic and creative, which is by definition not systematic. So my problem with that, these competing ideologies is that they're taking very legitimate grievances, mm -hmm. but they're using those grievances as a kind of Trojan horse for their own very systematic views. And I'm not into that, man. <laughs> it's not my bag. I'm not into that. I, I, the, the point is, is that, and the and I feel that the only way that you can put a check on the tendency towards systematic or utopian solutions is free speech. Is to have a healthy counterculture, which is intrinsic to the culture. You know, my, my great heroes were not people who said, or who say. You know, all school teachers are cunts, they're, they're fucking suffocating me, so therefore everything they teach is wrong, the whole school's wrong. It's not that. Uh, I always got... This was all intuitive, but looking back on it now, my idea of rebellion coming from someone like Jim Morrison, for instance, or the Romantics, or you could say like the Pre-Raphaelites is a good example in terms of Christianity, like... Or someone like Woody Guthrie, in fact. Take Woody Guthrie's Jesus Christ. It's saying, you're all professing this kind of Christianity. This is, Christianity is the inherent religion in the society, and yet when I present to you a situation where someone is called on to be truly Christ-like, in the modern world, he'd be just as persecuted and uh, hated as he would be, as he was, you know, 2,000 odd years ago. So, so uh, I'm trying to get, I've got lots of strands of thought that I haven't organised in my head. Um, so, yeah, anyway. I guess that, that I guess I've said my piece, but yes, no, there we are. My idea of dissent come, comes from 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 something like that, where it's a uh, rather than break the rules and destroy the rules or destroy the system, man. Far more effective, and and I'm telling you, if you want to wind up a right wing conservative fundamentalist, you do it this way. I like, and you know how I know this because I went to fucking boarding school, mate. I went to fucking boarding school and I got chucked out of boarding school and I know how to fight these fuckers. I have experienced firsthand all these quote unquote privilege privileges. Right. I've seen it and I've been on the brunt of it as well, by the way. Um where if you're not this very specific kind of drone clone of everyone else, then you're automatically bad. You couldn't possibly be just someone who thinks for themselves. You can possibly just be a creative person. You're basically either trying to be in the first fifteen and an A student, or you're a degenerate. I mean, it was simple as that, right? If you if you if you're if you're in any way trying to question the rules, even no matter how stupid they are, then you're a troublemaker. You're not just someone who actually might have a point. So the the I've seen that kind of regimented conservatism, and I've lived it. So I know how to fight it. And the way you fight it is by being more, in, in, in a way, being radically conservative. In a way, you go back to first principles. So I remember, you not using because it was sincere, I remember um, I would start taking a stance that they were very unchristian. You know, kind of that they were desecrating the temple would be my my position, and that became and that really winds them up. So you take the things that are very sacred to them about their conservative values, say like the rule of law, or Christianity, or you know, you name it. And this is not just some tactic. This is a this is the real effective counterculture, and you can see it in the Romantics. They go back to first principles with Judeo Christian values. They re-examine first principles in terms of the uh, Greco-Roman tradition. The pre-Raphaelites did that with, with, with uh, kind of like Woody Guthrie presenting a more realistic, contemporary manifestation of, of Christ's purity in the world and really giving him a human face. 
by realistic depictions uh, that were unflinching in terms of a kind of social commentary. And that, that I mean, that, that winds them up. That winds up the conservative right, if you, you know, or the, the, the hierarchical conservative much more than just raging about communism or, or saying that there's an oppressor or an oppressed because it's so simplistic that it's easy dismissed. So, and also it's this idea that if you change and augment, you get, is this, I don't agree with the premise that by being paranoid about my language, I'm somehow going to make the world a better place. This doesn't work. It doesn't work. My, my feeling, the liberal humanist position is that you, 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 you ensure that there's enough free thinking, that there's enough education, that there's enough of a healthy, enriched culture, which helps. I mean, I felt this. I'm saying this is some, I'm not saying this is, is some finger wagging from on high. I experienced it having been, like my friend the other night was saying, you don't know what it's like to have your existence just denied. Actually, I do, man. I fucking do. Every time some nasty hipster makes some uh, traducing, uh, disgusting, snidey remark, sarcasm, all of that, we all get it on some level. But I had it particularly at school, and I feel that rage right now, believe me. I know what that's like, but the thing that saved me was not ideology. The thing that saved me was realizing that I could have my own independent relationship with mathematics with Shakespeare. And once I had that relationship, I would then have the ammunition to argue my point with them. It's really... It's... It, it does much more damage to them when you, argue, when you beat them on their own terms and, and, you, and you... You know more about what they're finger-wagging about than they are, than they do. Um, and that was the thing that got me about Jim Morrison is that he, he was, uh, you know, he'd read Shakespeare and he'd read the classics and Homer and the, the beats too. All these guys knew the rules before they broke the rules. And that was their power. Know the rules before you break the rules. And once you've, because uh, the, the difference between the hierarchical conservative who just knows the rules and knows how to play the game is that that's as far as it goes for them. If you you become truly creative with the rules of the culture. Then you become, then you have the power to influence the culture rather than trying to demolish it and put some systematic solution in its place. You have the power to evolve the culture on its own terms. So that the when, when someone's trying to shut you down and say this is blah, 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 you say actually you're the one that's being anti-Christian. You're the one that's being anti um that is threatening the rule of law and and the the liberty of the citizen. You're the one. You're the one. Um, and it isn't just a tactic. It's an important. It's a it, it's a genuinely more potent and important form of dissent. I don't know. What I, I I don't know if I've said what I need to say on that. But I think that ultimately, I really get triggered by this political correct defense when people say, as if the only reason that you would be criticizing political correctness is because you must have some surreptitious agenda. I really have a kind of contempt for that position. It really winds me up because it's 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 actually very arrogant on some level. It's saying that the, nobody could possibly disagree with me unless they were some hateful bigot. I I have the right answer, you know? Um, and there, there are very few moral questions which can never be questioned. You know, even in philosophy, we are talking about this the other night, that even in the most rigorous philosophical, analytical, abstract conversations about right and wrong, say someone says, well, there's no real morality, it's just uh, sort of personal taste that's extrapolated towards common interests. Then someone says, well, is it possible to say that it's always wrong to torture babies? And then that relativist, who has quite a nice theory in the face of it, starts saying, oh shit, in order to defend my position, I'm going to have to say that, oh, yeah, maybe there is some possible world in which it's, 
it, or possible situation in which it's okay to torture babies. And then they get into a whole backtracking thing and they've got a blah, blah, blah. And so someone can maybe turn around and say, well, there's just some things. We were talking about this. There's just some things that are just not right to say. There are just some things that are um, off the table. We've already had that discussion and to even begin to debate it is in some way to facilitate a kind of nasty undermining of, of human rights, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, if, if, it, if I cannot in some way challenge the idea that it's always wrong to torture babies, which it is almost commonsensically the case, okay? No one's going to really, on a, on a practical everyday level, deny that unless they're a psychotic or whatever the definition is. It is still useful to have that discussion on many levels as a philosophical instrument in order to establish a greater foundation of why I think that it's always wrong to torture babies and you know and when you have that greater established philosophical position you're 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 in much more of a uh, strengthened position to actually attack hateful bigotry when it's presented so there that would be my position on that so it is deeply important to criticize political correctness and there are Given given that, that how many careers are ruined because people have been mis people's views have been misrepresented, given how many books are taken off the bookshelves just because someone associates someone with some movement that they don't actually subscribe to, having a paranoia about this stuff isn't healthy for society, and to question it is a matter of common sense. It's got nothing to do with defending hatred, and and at least there must be a pluralist amount of values. A pluralist, a plurality, sorry, of possibilities as to why one would criticise political correctness. That's all I ask. I'm not asking anyone to agree with me. I'm just asking that people admit that there might be a number of different reasons why someone would have, say, the position I have, rather than it just being automatically some reactionary position. That's all I ask. And, I, and, and we are living in a world now that... The minute you say you criticize a certain set of orthodoxies, you're automatically in a box that isn't fair and it's not justified and actually it's destructive to society and destructive to dissent and destructive to the rights of human, uh, minorities in, in, in the ultimate way that it plays out. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. That's Fear of Black Planet, episode 108. Thank you.